Stay tuned for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hello, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled is photographer Greg Gorman, and you'll see his work on the set today, and comedian actress Jennifer Rawlings. Jennifer Rawlings was born and raised in Kansas. She left the small town of Salina to venture to the big town of Fort Worth and the Texas Christian University. That didn't last very long, and she found herself in New York City. But I'm ahead of the story. At 15, she played an extra in a movie uh, that was playing in Selena. Actually, they were using Selena as a backdrop. Is that right? That's right. And what happened there? Well, basically, everybody in my family was in this movie. It was called Mad Magazine <laughs> Presents at the Academy. And it was a really brilliant film. You've probably seen it. It was on the Oscars. So time. many times. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so then I moved to, um, went to school at Texas Christian University, and I was studying to be a pediatrician and dropped out and my parents were really excited about that. Um, <laughs> I moved to New York City and did some modeling. And How did you get into modeling? Well, there's a big agency in Dallas, um, Kim Dawson. Oh. So I was working, doing some stuff with her and then found myself in New York. So you were the blonde, blue-eyed Texas girl who uh -huh. came to New York? <laughs> <laughs> well, just basic, you know, just simple commercial stuff, nothing, oh. nothing real extravagant. But um, <laughs> Anyway, so then I moved to New York City, and I went to see the taping of Saturday Night Live, and that's the first time I ever saw stand-up, because they didn't have a lot of clubs in Salina. And I just thought, <laughs> this is what I'm going to do with my life. So I moved to L.A. But and wait, who was on Saturday Night Live? Someone who was in Salina. Oh, yeah, Robert Downey Jr. <laughs> I thought he... that was very pushy for you to talk to him. <laughs> Don't leave that out. <laughs> well, see, he... Actually, what's really funny is he lived across the street from me in New York City, too, on 86th. And um, no, he was on Saturday Night Live, so I called him up and I said, do you remember me? <laughs> I'm from Salina, Kansas. And so he invited me to come down and see Saturday Night Live. And so then I saw stand-up for the first time, and that's how I got oh. to doing stand-up. And I was just so positive I was going to be a hit that I moved to L.A. thinking I was going to do Johnny Carson the next week. So well, you I didn't, didn't know a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> How did uh, you do your first stand-up piece? Did you, you, did, you didn't do it in New York. I did it in New York. Oh, you did? At a club called Who, Who's On First, and I wrote five minutes, <laughs> and I only have one joke from that original five minutes still in my act. And what, what's that? Uh, do you remember? Yeah, I do. Do you? Um, well, actually, you know, see, I've noticed that, like, the beggars in Kansas are a lot different than, like, the beggars out here in Los Angeles because the beggars in Kansas ask for things like corn, husk, <laughs> 10 cents for a Slim Jim. And on the way over here, I was on Rodeo Drive, and this beggar came up to me. He was in this 500 SEL, SL, I don't remember how you spell it. He said, excuse me, can I please borrow $20 to help reestablish my credit rating? So I gave him a dollar. He gave me a receipt. <laughs> that's, that's the difference. Uh -huh. And that's what you started doing? That's what I started doing. That was one of my first jokes. So. And you still use it? I still use it. <laughs> How could you um, give up modeling, which was such a lucrative career probably, or a steady career yeah. anyway, for acting in uh, Hollywood? Well, <laughs> I don't know. I just thought this is something I can do, and I can do this till I'm 100 years old. And um, You think I, so? You, know, you don't I'm think the time comes and but goes? I think you can definitely do comedy a lot longer than you can do swimwear ads. Yeah, and, that's um, true. <laughs> especially now since I've had two kids, I don't think I'd be hired to do swimmer ads anymore. <laughs> would you give up, would you give up um, comedy for acting? I love doing stand-up, so I would still, you know, still do stand-up, but sure, I wouldn't mind being on a sitcom. <laughs> have, you done, have you done anything like that? 
I've done, um, you know, little guest appearances and, you know, the different stand-up shows that are on all the networks and stuff so like that. So you're just basically your everyday stand-up comedian. Uh-huh. Your everyday. <laughs> I'm your run-of-the-mill stand-up comedian. <laughs> you did uh, a show, I guess a radio show, called Bob and Jennifer. I thought that was funny. Oh, it's, it actually has been such a great thing. Um, we've been doing it for two and a half years now, and it's... Um, I. My partner is a comedian by the name of Robert Lee, and it's called Bob and Jennifer from Woodland Hills. <laughs> and it's on 200 country stations, and it's like a modern-day George and Gracie. Um, it's a real stretch for me to play Gracie, but um, it's like a, <laughs> it's a modern-day George and Gracie. How long are the segments? Just two minutes. Really? And it's a couple times a week, and it's really fun. And what, really what are the, what's the subject matter, especially if you're on a country station? And I said Selena wrong. It's Salina. Salina. It's Salina, the well, city we, on the move. We have uh, Salinas, California, so I thought maybe it was a, you know, a close. Yeah, there's a lot of copycat things from Kansas <laughs> to California, but um, <laughs> no. Um, Bob and Jennifer, <coughs> it's um, it's been really great. And the subject, the reason we're on country stations is because it's a very family-oriented skit, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, Bob and I are, are married in the skits, and we have a couple kids. In fact, we use the names of my children in the skits, and so. It's, and I think country is very wholesome. And Did so you that's write the material? We write them. You write it together. Sometimes we write them the night before, and sometimes at about ten till eight, because we phone in at eight o'clock. We're sitting there writing the skits. Are you kidding? <laughs> how do you do that? I mean, don't you get nervous about how you're going to fill the time? No, because uh, there's a formula to it. You know, we do it like um, there's a twist. And, a, and a, like, for instance, um, we'll say it, we're going to go register to vote today. And I'll say, well, I want to register for two place settings of China and a fondue oh. set. <laughs> and so we can always take a subject and make a twist out of it. So That's he fun. gives you the subject and you make the twist or you do the opposite? We just write them together on the <laughs> phone. <laughs> what was your really big break in stand-up? Obviously, Bob and Jennifer wasn't since it's on the radio. It's on the radio. <laughs> Actually, you know, Bud Friedman at the Improv has been so sweet to me. When I very first started doing stand-up, I think I'd only been on stage like six times, and he let me start emceeing and hosting. And then I hosted the American Comedy Convention for him. But you and know, so Bud Friedman's been on the show. He's great. He's wonderful, but he's been in the business for so long, years. He started in, in New York, and I think he can spot people. <laughs> <laughs> so he went, this girl can do the, the work. Well, he's a great guy, and actually, you know, I'm really excited to be here. I, I'm excited and honored to be on your show today because, you know, I almost didn't make it. What happened? Well, I'm embarrassed to say this, but I got arrested yesterday for shoplifting. Oh. It was on the Home Shopping Network, and um, the police came and took my phone. You were, so. you were, you were shoplifting on the Home Shopping <laughs> so Network? That was kind of a bummer. <laughs> and, um, but actually, you know, I'm excited to be anywhere because, you know, being from Salina, Kansas, um, it's kind of, I'm excited to be anywhere. I was, I actually, you know, I was born during a tractor pull in Kansas. Um, it was kind of a painful birth, but, you know, the reason I was born during a tractor pull is because my parents are real affluent, you know, they have tractor pull season tickets, and um, so we're... <laughs> we don't know what a tractor pull is. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> it's a really exciting thing. It's, um, it's where you get, uh, well, a tractor pull, you, it's in dirt, <laughs> And um, these big tractors, they'll pull cars across and they'll race. And that's what a tractor pull is. Oh. So that's why I was born during. And, um, but you know, I go back to Kansas a lot to visit um, my parents and stuff. And I usually have a very hard time even making it home to Kansas. Because usually what happens is that the flights get canceled because of lack of interest. And I don't know, this really hurts our feelings because I mean, the flights of planes are small, but they're getting them smaller. In fact, you have both the window and the aisle seat. <laughs> Actually, you fly the plane. So I'm sitting there flying the plane, and I was crying because I don't know how to fly. So I rolled down this window to ask his Delta Pilot directions. He gave me directions. I gave him some Grey Poupon. <laughs> but the directions were wrong, so I wound up in Bakersfield. Oh, is that what happened? <laughs> They've never seen a plane there before, so I'm a goddess to them. I think Bakersfield <laughs> and Salina are on the same level. They are. <laughs> they must do tractor pulls in Bakersfield. I'm sure they do. Uh, actually, you know, um, people... Um, people make fun of, of the Midwest and the South and stuff, but actually I'm exactly like all the girls in the Midwest because I always carry a clarinet in the trunk of my car because you just never know when that pageant might come along. So I'm always ready to go. Were you a part of pageants? Did <laughs> no, you, I did. Did you, oh, yes, did I was. I was in the Junior Miss um, 
What is it called? I think it's just called Junior Miss. <laughs> What's it called? I don't know. I wasn't there. <laughs> I was in the Junior Miss contest, and um, that was really exciting. I think I sang to a thing from the chorus line. It was really original for pageants, you know, sing the chorus, <laughs> chorus line. line. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever think of going on Broadway? Oh, I'd love to. But not as a stand-up. <laughs> <laughs> but it, I, I'd love to be on Broadway. I haven't gotten a lot of calls for it, but... Um, but I think I'd be really good on it. <laughs> You're doing something now, a show that's called I Take Out the Trash. Uh-huh. Um, what do I call it? Take Out the Dirt. Take something. Out the Dirt. <laughs> Same thing. Tell us what it is, Take Out the Trash. Well, it, it's, it's really exciting <clears throat> because we've done about six of them here in Los Angeles um, at Igby's Comedy Club in West L.A. And we're going to be doing another one soon. It's all clean comedy. Like, no bad language, no suggestive language, just a really good time. And people turn out in force for this show because they're so excited to see clean comedy without all the garbage that goes along with it, you know? And um, Do you edit it? Uh, or do you edit the work? Or do you give no, any this kind is of a guidelines? Um, yes, I do. I, you know, when pe like Fritz Coleman's been on it, Jimmy Brogan, who, you know, all, lots of people have been on The Tonight Show and stuff like that. And basically I say, you know, just no bad language and no suggestive language. And, I mean, these shows get standing ovations, and they're very popular. In fact, um, you know, a totally packed audience for it. Do you and think so, that's a new trend with all this other, like, the, I hope uh, so. <laughs> the F word every <laughs> other time for no reason at all? Yeah, I hope so. I mean, I think people really have a good time seeing clean humor and, you know, just have fun. But everyone hasn't come from Kansas. They might have a hard time <laughs> <laughs> writing some material. Well, you know, I basically, the show, I host the show and there's usually five or six comedians on it and we've had, you know, singing impressionist Danny Gans, who's awesome. In fact, I met him when I was working at a convention and he got a standing ovation from 50,000 people. And um, so when he came and did my show, he got a standing ovation from 160 people. I see. And, um, so that was great, and then, like I said, Fritz Coleman and Jimmy Brogan and all sorts of people. You moved out to uh, California and had a family. It sounded like instant California, <laughs> boom, boom. <laughs> I have two kids. I have a three-year-old and a nine-month-old. Actually, my nine-month-old, he, um, he was nine pounds when he was born. Wow. I had him natural. Wow. Well, until it hurt anyway. And, um, but actually, no, I was prepared when I had him because since he was my second, as soon as I found out I was pregnant, I rushed out and bought that epidural home kit. And um, that works pretty good. <laughs> you want to know something? We thank you for being with us. You haven't been on The Tonight Show, but you've been on the Joan Quinn Profiles. <laughs> hey, that's great. <laughs> and we appreciate your coming on. Maybe they'll call and want you on tonight after they see this. I'm sure they will. Jay? <laughs> Give me a call. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being Thank with you us, very Jennifer. Much. And don't go away because Greg Gorman will be right back to explain these wonderful photographs. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and we're back with photographer Greg Gorman, who was born in Kansas City, Missouri. He majored in photojournalism at the University of Kansas and at UC, uh, University of Southern California. And in 1972, he earned a Master of Fine Arts in Cinematography from USC. His photographs have been published in magazines throughout the world. Greg, were you a cinema uh, in cinema school? Well, I, my final degree was in cinematography, but I chose to go back to doing stills, which was my initial uh, major and I found it was a little bit more personal, I had a little more control of what I was doing as opposed to being a cinematographer. Did you think one day that you would be a great filmmaker? Is that what you no, were I doing? No, I never thought about it. I basically had studied photography to a certain degree and, I, and everybody advised me that was professionals in the field said, if, you know, you really should just maybe study film because you've taken photography about oh. in the study field as far as you would take it. So, but I, I still love taking pictures more than working on the movies. Did you start early? Did you have a brownie camera? Fortunately, I was lucky because my career, I always began as a photographer and kind of stayed with it. I, my first experience was picking up a camera to shoot a Jimi Hendrix concert in the mid-60s in Kansas City and from there I started studying photojournalism and took it from there. Is that how you you went to school there and did that bring you to California? I came out here to finish school and I was going to go to school at Brooks but at that point... Oh, which is a photography school. Which is a school. photography school but I was advised by a couple of friends of mine that were working professionally. They said unless you want to become a technician you're better off to study film and that's where I ended up at USC. So it gave you, film gave you the a little different eye? 
Yeah, the first thing they ask you in film <laughs> school it? is how many of you are still photographers? And half the people raise their hands thinking this is going to be a great uh, benefit. And they said, you guys are going to have the most trouble because you think in terms of static images, now you've got to change that and think in terms of moving images. But that must have really helped you in With your the lighting and whatnot, it was great. But it yeah. must have helped you in your still photography because your, your photography moves. So you got that movement. Picked up a little bit of movement there. <laughs> you got More that recently, movement. anyway. Did you ever think when you were in school that you could make a living uh, as a photographer? Well, I always thought I could. My dad certainly didn't. <laughs> I was going to say, how would you ever think that? And I said, look, I don't want to put a coat and tie on every day and hurry down the freeway to sell furniture. So, And he couldn't understand. <laughs> thought I was going to be a bum all my life taking pictures. You know, he thought there was never enough money in it. Well, that's what I would think. But then the difference comes when you do um, commercial work. I well, think. exactly. It's the commercial work that pays the big bills, and it's the editorial that gets you to the commercial part. My dad never cared who I was photographing. You know, it was never, are you shooting Barbara Streisand or Bette Midler or David Bowie? It was how much are you getting paid? Exactly. But in the commercial world, you could get paid. What's right. the difference? Tell our audience the difference between when you talk about editorial and you talk about commercial. Well, editorial work, you have a little bit more free reign in most circumstances to do your own interpretation of pictures, and you're paid by a magazine to do a Greg Gorman portrait of a person. And you can pretty much have a little more looser reins. Not always, but in most cases. And they the fees, come to you? They come to me. Either the magazines will come to me. Oftentimes, at this point in my career, it's usually the personalities that will request me. And sometimes the magazines will buy it, and sometimes they won't. That depends on the art director. But in the beginning, how do you get started in editorial? Um, you go paddle your portfolio. You get yourself a portfolio, and you put it together, and you go, and you see the art directors at the various magazines that you feel you're qualified to work for, and hopefully you'll get in the door. Sometimes you'll get a break, and sometimes you won't. And I, as you know, my first <laughs> big break came with Interview Magazine in the beginning of the 80s. I shot my first interview cover, actually, with Maxwell Caulfield for the late Robert Hayes. And but Robert Hayes was a real photography buff. Yes, he was. And he wanted to find new photographers because I was working at Interview at the time. Right, exactly. And, and uh, Robert always went out and looked for new people. So when you came in with a portfolio, he would always spend time on it. The thing is, you have to take something in your portfolio. How do you get that portfolio together? Beg, bar, and steal. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, it's, it's calling on friends. I was lucky early in my career to photograph a few personalities and they had friends and friends of friends and it uh -huh. kind of snowballed from there. So then that goes into your portfolio and you take it to a magazine. Right. Now, how does commercial work come out of that? Uh, commercial or does it work, come first? No, basically the commercial work came later. Uh, commercial work comes from art directors ripping pages out of magazines saying, oh, I like that look, I like the way this is photographed. This is a campaign we're designing and your pictures ultimately end up being used to design campaigns which agencies pitch uh -huh. to clients and then they go, well, this is the person that took this picture. I think he would be right to shoot the campaign. I see. And then, what kind of say-so do you have in editorial work? What kind of say-so does the photographer have, and what kind of say-so do you have um, in the commercial, commercial work? work? It's really contingent upon the art director, but obviously in commercial work you have much less say-so uh, as far as having more complete control. You have much more control. In the younger, fresher magazines, like Interview was when we were working for them, which I, I don't find that anymore with Interview. I think it's kind of changed directions I think all the magazines have changed I think a the lot. Detour uh, now has a much fresher look and has a little bit of what Interview had at the beginning, big pictures. Right. Uh, no one ever calls me and says what I have to do when I shoot a layout for Detour magazine. I go out, take the pictures, and supply them with the pictures I want to see run, which is how it worked in the old days at Interview. Yeah, but that's a different thing. That's a magazine that's like uh, almost like an underground magazine. Exactly. And that's how Interview was at that time. Exactly. But what if you're uh, shooting for Italian Vogue or American Vogue or many of the magazines, British Vogue, that you shoot for? Right. What a, lot they, a lot of times they, a lot of times, well, if you're doing a fashion layout, they will send you the clothes or they will supply you the clothes or they will bring the clothes. But, you know, most of my work is more personality-oriented, so I'm more apt to shoot the celebrities. And sometimes uh, a stylist will come and bring clothes for them. It's in the cover of, like, Manor Vogue and, and magazines like that, British Vogue. But uh, in that case, they, they bring the clothes. And you have a certain amount of say, but, for example, sometimes they'll say, well, we want a white background for this picture. It's got to be a studio picture. It's not as loose. With commercial work, they allow my impression, because they're hiring me because of my style, but they still have parameters within you've got to follow. I'm surprised. I would think it would be the other way around. I'm surprised that the commercial work gives you uh, so much of a free reign. No, the commercial work doesn't give you oh, so much doesn't. free reign. No, I'm saying they give you more guidelines that you have to work That's within a parameter think. than you do with your editorial work. Oh. No, the commercial work is much more demanding as far as their precise demands. So when it comes to not talking about bottom line money, what do you prefer to do? 
Well, I <laughs> prefer to do and need to do are two different things. Prefer to do editorial because it's fun and exciting. The commercial work is what pays the bills, though. So you have to reach a happy medium, a balance between the two. So you can do stuff that gives you that creative freedom and chance to go out and explore new things, but the commercial work is what pays the bills. You know, when we were working together, we would do a shoot, say, of a celebrity. And as you say, a stylist brings in the clothes, and a makeup person does the makeup, and a hair person, and a... Uh, Props. You, or, and yeah. you have an assistant working for you. How much hand does the photographer actually have in what's going on? I think a tremendous hand. I mean, I work specifically with my own makeup and my own hair people. Um, Oh, you I asked recently for did, your own right, people? Right. I recently did a, a photo session with an actress who will remain unnamed, but we did a shoot, and uh, I was unhappy with the hair. This was just this past week, unhappy with the hair. I was unhappy with the makeup. The clothes really weren't what I thought they should be, and uh, I reshot the session later in the week with my own hair people, my own makeup people, my own stylist, and the difference was between night and day. And then did they accept what you had oh, done? Oh, yeah, they accepted it. I, I, uh, on the first pictures, I said, I'm unhappy with the pictures. I don't like them. I want to reshoot. And that doesn't happen very often, but I was, it was, I was out of my control. The, the personality brought in their own makeup and hair people. Oh, I and see. And the stylist came from the magazine, who was an excellent stylist. I just wasn't thrilled with the clothes. And unfortunately, it didn't work and, uh, for me. And I didn't want to see those pictures published with my name on them. And so they allowed me to reshoot it. That works for you when you can bring in your own people. What happens when they say, we're, we're sending these makeup people in? Do you give them specific instructions? I want light makeup, uh, I work with them. Makeup. I don't let that happen very often. I've got to tell you, I mean, you know, I, uh, that's one of the reasons I'm, I'm much more involved with doing my photography than with being a cinematographer or whatnot, is because it's, to me, very, very important that the look that goes out there is a look that is what I do and what represents a Greg Gorman photograph. So I don't work with too many makeup artists that I don't know. Very rarely does that happen. And then uh, the props. I know a photographer always usually sets up his own shots and knows what right. to do. So you know, I always set up my own shots and, and uh, design what I'm going to be working with. Sometimes it's spontaneous and it develops on the set, but uh, many times I have you know, preconceived ideas of what I want to do and how I want to do it. Do you know all of the, um, <laughs> after reading your bio and knowing how much you've been involved in it, but I wonder how much does a photographer really have to know about the mechanics of the camera? Because if you have this assistant helping you do things, do you really have to know everything? Well, I think you've got to begin at a point where you, in most cases, teach the assistant what's going on. There's many photographers today <laughs> that I think don't have a clue that have uh, top assistants that basically do everything for them, and they basically just are the conceptual person. I think that's happening more and more today. I don't think it happened at the point in time when most of the well, photographers that I know started. That's what I was wondering, because it seems like you know all the technical uh, you have the technical ability of what happens with your camera when you shoot it, besides right. the conceptual idea. I think that's not such a, a, a truism today with the, <laughs> with the fact we were talking before you started taping today about the fact that so many of the incredible 35 millimeter cameras that are out now, I mean, there's the state of the art cameras, they're autofocus, auto exposure, they follow focus, they do everything for you. All you gotta do is pick up the camera and half the people don't even know how to load them. Their assistant hands them a loaded camera, it's through the roll and it's done. But I was shocked that you said you do use an automatic. Oh, absolutely. For the 35 focus millimeter. Automatic. For automatic focus automatic exposure a lot of the stuff I'll do in my editorial stuff because you have the chance of capturing something that's so spontaneous and so quick that you couldn't oh. focus or get the setting done quick enough to do it and still capture that moment that's the fun thing about those cameras now we've talked about all that other work that you've done editorial and I think I interrupted you when you said uh, the um, you were going to talk about the fees in editorial um, which are well fees in <coughs> editorial can range from zero for a magazine like Detour. I mean, it's not uncommon for me to do a cover shoot for Detour magazine and spend four or five, six thousand dollars on a shoot. But in the same respect, if the pictures are good, I'll earn it back, you know, ten, more than tenfold in sales. And where will on. you sell them? Um, <coughs> for example, we did a shoot with Keanu Reeves. It was a cover shoot for Detour uh, a while <coughs> back. And those pictures appeared all throughout Europe on magazine covers. And we, we limited the sales to one per country. But the sales uh, averaged, you know, up I pretty see. good. Because I know when I first, I, br I brought that magazine to you. And right. I And I wanted them to do it because I felt like it was the same time we were working at Interview. Exactly. And it gave me right that. Right in the very beginning, Joan. Yeah, right in the very beginning. The other thing is, you've done books with, right. is that totally different from the kind of shoots you do? Do you have to set up certain shoots to, to uh, have Yes, yes prints? and no. My, my book of, my, my newest book, of volume two, which is a book of nudes, male and female nudes, was specifically designed for that. And tell us a little bit about, these right. are from the books, I think. These are a couple of portraits from the book. For example, the shoot with Iman, this is good in explaining on whether or not these are 
prearranged shoots or whatnot. Iman and I had spoken uh, for quite a while about doing pictures, and uh, at one point she knew she was coming out to LA. This is when she was still living in New York. <laughs> And she called me and said she was coming out, and we got together and did this session. And that picture came from that session and was for a book project. The picture there, which is called Echo in the Sand, was actually a shoot that was commissioned for German Playboy. Um, she was a model that I discovered in Santa Fe with uh, my associate Kevin Lynch in a bar, actually. And she <laughs> went on to become a playmate for German Playboy and a, and a playmate for American Playboy. And she had done nothing up to that point. That was a picture that had been commissioned, but I used for my book project. Now, that brings me to the point of can photographers make stars? Oh, I it think seems absolutely. Like they can have. certainly create images. Uh -huh. um, to I think, make a personality into a star. I think absolutely. I think that, you know, if you, you take someone like James Dean, who was obviously a major star, for his short-lived uh, career, he did an incredible amount of photo sessions. And those photographs, <laughs> all of us see practically daily. It's like an icon. Um, those images that are still around today have kept his image alive and larger than life, more so, I think, than the three movies he made. I think be, before we leave, another way of making stars was this campaign. I love this. From one book, you, you've done, what, three volumes I have now? two volumes that are my own and, and several anthologies. And several other volumes. But you started doing the, the LA campaign. LA Artworks campaign. Which I've done I thought for like was, 12, 13 years now. Which, which was great because I saw you, you chose the people to be in the campaign. And I saw you one day just open a rack of, of uh, frames and let the person pick what fit their right. personality, and then you went to it. And right, this was exactly. one of the first ones. What was That this? was about the third or fourth ad <laughs> we shot with Rob Lowe, and uh, he was one of the few subjects that really looked lousy with glasses on. He was so much better looking without him. It's, it's the only ad we ever got away with in all the years of the iWorks campaign. It's funny that you picked that, that the person is not wearing the glasses. They had a fit because they said, you know, we got to have the glasses on the person's face. But, uh, but you got away with it, and the glasses showed, and this was in an Interview think, Magazine. Yes, and I think one of the exceptions to this campaign that made this such a successful campaign was the amount of creative control that we had with the campaign. And it was all for you. We have to go. Well, thank you, Joan. Thanks, and I know you you lecture everywhere, and you you go all over the world, and I thank you for taking the time thanks. out and being with us. And thanks for watching us, and thanks for writing those letters to 520 South Grand, 8th floor, Los Angeles 71, and we'll see you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles.